These have been the heroes of three years worth of games at my table. Ari, Bjorn, and Dana have killed giants, slain dragons, and sealed away Tiamat, of all things. So I want something physical for the players to keep in memory of their characters. But as the dungeon master, and a bit of a miniatures collector, I want to hold on to those hero minis. So what else can I give them instead? Something to memorialize the countless hours of dice rolling that these characters have been a part of. Hopefully something that'll be a bit more noticeable on their shelf. Something a bit bigger than a tiny little miniature. How about a heroic bust of each of their characters? A small token trophy that can sit on their desk or on a shelf? I mean, I already have the files for their Heroforge minis. All this is going to take is a few alterations. First things first, that means a quick trip to Blender. This will be a fairly simple process, but I'm not going to bore you with the details. First I'm going to import the model for our miniature, and scale it up 500%. Something that will make a bit more of a substantial bust. I then create a simple block with a 45 degree V carved into the top. I'll push and pull some of the edges of this shape to cover all the areas of the miniature that I want to remove, making sure to maintain that 45 degree slice. I then add another block to create a small flat surface on the base of that cut, so that the model actually has something to adhere to the build plate of our printer. Before I use these shapes to slice away these chunks of the model, I'll remesh it. This adds a bit more detail to the surface so that I can smooth out any of the blocky areas with Blender's sculpting tools. Heroforge models are naturally designed to be printed at a pretty small scale, so sometimes when you blow them up you'll notice they're quite a low resolution. Smoothing them out with the sculpting tools will just help to make this less noticeable on the much larger print of our bust. With the model sculpted and smooth, I slice away our desired shape from the model, and create a hole where the plinth will be inserted later. And with that done, we can now bring our newly created bust into the slicer. If you would like a more detailed breakdown tutorial for the steps I just took to create this bust, let me know down below and I'll be happy to do a follow up video or maybe a short covering my process. With our model in the slicer, I now go around painting on all of the areas that will need organic tree supports. I did print these busts quite a while ago now, so I'm actually still using Prusa Slicer here. And pretty much following my print settings from the FDM printing guide video that I released a couple of months ago. However, I would maybe recommend checking out Orca Slicer as an alternative. Either way, the only variation from my guide video is that I increased the size of the supports, and then this was ready for printing. And this model turned out fantastic. All I had to do was go around and start pulling off the support materials. I did a little bit of cleanup, removing any small areas of stringing, curling, or anywhere that blobs had formed on overhanging areas. Overall this print looks great, there's very few layer lines on the actual character itself, and just a little bit of cleanup that we need to do on some of the edges. I will come in with a couple different grit sandpapers, just to smooth out the carved edges of the bust to make sure that they look nice and clean and flat once they're painted. Firstly, a rough sand with a low grit sandpaper evened out these areas and another pass with a finer grit smoothed them out fantastically. I primed all of these busts with just a couple of Rust-Oleum cans that I had lying around. They were both pretty similar shades of grey, so when I tried to do a bit of a zenithal it wasn't all that noticeable. However, the way that I'm going to paint these, the zenithal isn't going to show through anyway. It was just for me to know where to place the light later on, so even if it is subtle, it'll still be enough to inform those decisions. And now, we can start painting. When it comes to large surfaces like this, I ended up finding that a thin first layer is a good starting point. The coverage will be terrible, but it will set up future layers for better success. I started with what at first I thought would be my shadow tone, but ended up being something more of a mid-tone, which works out really nicely when I end up coming in with the airbrush later. With our first layer done, I come in with two more almost unthinned coats of our mid-tone just to get that base smooth and fully covering the skin areas of the bust. With a model this large, I decided the airbrush was probably the best option for some of the smoother transitions I wanted to do on the skin. I don't have space for a full airbrush setup, so I have one of these small handheld compressors, and it works great. It did take me buying a few of these to finally find one that works well, and this is by far the best one I've tried. They'll never have the power or the reliability of a full-size compressor, but they do the job just fine for projects like this. 
I did a final thin airbrush of our mid-tone over any areas that didn't quite have full coverage yet. Then I mixed up a highlight tone and started picking out any of the raised areas that would be catching light. And a lot of these areas were inspired by the Zenithal from earlier. At this point I decided he needed some richer and darker shadow tones on the skin. So I mixed up a slightly warmer and slightly darker skin tone and sprayed this into all of the crevices such as where the belts and cloak meet the skin, but also in the shadowed areas, such as under the eyes and around the armpit. The airbrush did speed up this process a lot, and made some really nice smooth gradients on these large areas of skin. It's not entirely necessary, you could have gone in with a dry brush to achieve the same effect, and airbrush is just much faster. I next grabbed a nice big brush, and started to base coat a few of the areas. The leathers, base coated in brown, the gold areas with a rich ochre, as well as giving the cloak a base coat of dark red and the hair a light grey. I always hesitate to use any washes on any clean paint jobs that I'm doing, but I knew here that I'd come in with a pretty heavy highlight on the hair later so I could touch up any mistakes that a wash might introduce. So a black wash went over the grey hair to darken it down and add some recessed shading, before I moved on to wet blending the cloak. This is a very subtle wet blend, but just enough that the top areas of the cape are a slightly brighter red. A dry brush of brass across all of the gold detailing was followed up by a coat of yellow speed paint to shade and brighten the metallic areas. I then moved back to the hair. Following the flow of the hair strands, I reapplied the light grey base coat to 90% of the hair, leaving the wash only in the deepest areas and points of separation. I then did a few coats, adding more and more white to punch the highlight and give the hair a softer look, and give it the appearance of reflecting a bit more light than the skin or the leathers. Speaking of the leathers, a simple hatched highlight was done with a lighter brown to some of the surface details. I highlighted these just enough to add a little bit of interest without drawing too much attention away from the face or the skin of the model. Now for the scary part, a little bit of freehanding. Buren is part Goliath, who appears mostly human. However, during our campaign it was made canon that his Goliath markings, which used to appear during his Barbarian Rage, began to become permanent in a divine gold colour, so I wanted to add these in. We never had a set look to these, so I added in some geometric shapes following some interesting images I found online, starting with an orange-brown and working in more and more brighter yellow as I worked into the centre of these details. Lastly, the eyes. A base coat of dark brown for both, followed by a white in the left eye, along with a blue iris and a black pupil. For his right eye, however, Buren's sight is a gift from Odin, which has made Buren's missing eye now alight with a runic golden glow. After a few finishing touches, and after painting the carved areas black, our bust of Buren is complete. This bust looks awesome, and having finished it, I'm really excited to move on to Ari and Dana's next. If you'd like to see me paint up those ones on the channel as well, let me know, I'd be happy to do a follow up video. While you're down there leaving your comments, please do consider liking the video if you enjoyed it or found it useful in any way, and subscribe to see more of my stuff in the future. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, have a good one.